Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Chinese State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi briefed the media on a Monday afternoon on the sidelines of the fifth session of the 13th National People's Congress in Beijing. So, what were some of the highlights of that briefing? And what are the priorities of China's foreign diplomacy this year? And on the 50th anniversary of the historic visit to China by former U.S. President Richard Nixon, how should we evaluate China U.S. relations? To consider these questions, I'm joined by Ms. Helga zeppler bruch founder and president of the Schiller Institute, Professor Peter Kuznick, professor of history from American University, and Professor Victor Galjakai, chair professor of Suchow University. That's our topic. I'm Li Qiuyuan. So that press conference was about 100 minute long. 27 questions were asked about China's diplomacy, covering a range of issues. Let me start with you, Professor Gao, because you sit through that press conference here with us at CDTN, right? So, what struck you the most today, uh, coming out from that press conference? Yes, indeed. I uh, sit through the whole uh, press conference and listen to all the questions and answers very carefully. I think State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi did a very comprehensive all-inclusive answers to some of the very difficult and challenging questions. What stood out very prominently to me was the message for peace and development and using diplomacy to solve the war in Ukraine. I, and I think this is very important because we are no longer in a normal situation right now in the world. We are faced with not only a conventional war involving Russia and Ukraine, but also mankind is pushed to the brink of a nuclear disaster. This is the time when countries like China need to exercise maximum restraint, use diplomacy in the highest form to promote peaceful resolution of whatever problems there may be between Russia and the Ukraine, and to restore peace because this is the only right path going forward. Foreign Minister Wang Yi also touched upon the whole range of issues involving China's foreign policy, including China's relations with EU, Japan, Latin America, Africa, ASEAN, South Korea, you name it. And I think it's all the message for peaceful dialogue and negotiation and common development. This is the main message for me. And I understand China is increasingly a force for peace and stability now in the world of turbulence in the world today. And Ms. LaRouge, let me get your take on this. What sort of key messages did you pick up from uh, pres uh, the Foreign Minister Wan's uh, press conference there? Well, I was actually very happy with the tone because, you know, it was like a, a return of sanity. It, it, this is in stark contrast to the atmosphere in the European and American media and politics in the recent uh, days. And I think the focus on solving problems through diplomacy, on you know, upholding the principles of the UN Charter uh, and having a general attitude towards problem solving uh, through cooperation, I think this was really a breath of fresh air. And I'm very, very uh, encouraged because China is really taking a leadership role in the world right now, which is badly needed. A number of questions was asked on the Ukraine issue, of course, that kind of dominated the first part of that press conference, right? Questions were asked about China's stance on this. Is China even disappointed in Russia? Will China do more? Are we seeing a new Cold War taking shape? Uh, Professor Kuznick, let me get your take on China's stance here. The State Councilor and Foreign Minister said on Monday that China is prepared to continue playing this constructive role in promoting peace talks between Russia and Ukraine, adding that a large scale of humanitarian crisis should be uh, prevented and the Red Cross Society of China here would provide urgent humanitarian aid to Ukraine. How do you, what's your read of Foreign Minister Wang's comment here? I think Foreign Minister Wang is on the right track, certainly, about diplomacy <clears throat> as the only way to solve the crisis right now. What I didn't hear was the kind of urgency that I'm looking for. The world is in a a real crisis right now, and the uh, this war can be stopped before we get to the point of an absolute humanitarian catastrophe. And China is, the, I, my opinion, the only country that can help solve this right now. China has said it recognizes Ukraine's sovereignty. 
China has heavy economic investments and ties in Ukraine. It's an important part of the Belt and Road Initiative. So he's got, got a good relation with Ukraine. And of course, they've got very good relations with Russia. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping has said that Vladimir Putin is his dearest friend in the world. And uh, they've got close economic and political ties with Russia. They also are in a position to put a little bit of, or a lot of economic pressure on Russia. They are Russia's safety valve now as the economic relations with Europe and the U.S. deteriorate. Russia is very dependent, increasingly so, on China now in order to prevent a complete breakdown of their economy. So China can exert more influence in this situation than anybody else. But I want to hear uh, uh, Foreign Minister Yang Wang talk about this with a sense of real urgency, that we're going to do this now and we're going to devote all our effort to ending this as quickly as possible, because this could otherwise drag on for quite some time. Professor Gao, let me get your response to this, because Professor Kuznick's view actually represented uh, the voices there we heard from the United States, from European countries, right? The EU and the U.S. want China to play as a mediator now, to, to mediate future peace talks. Is that reasonable? Well, a couple of points. Uh, first of all, China has very close and strategic relations with Russia. Russia and China share a common border of more than 4,700 kilometers long. For decades, it's a border of tranquility, peace, and uh, mutual beneficial exchanges of the peoples and uh, goods and services. We want to maintain the stability in China-Russian relations, and it's becoming more and more important in the world of great turmoil. On the other hand, China has very close relations with Ukraine. There are lots of Ukrainian friends working, living in China, including technicians and experts. And we want to maintain this close people-to-people -people exchanges between China and Ukraine. China as a whole is very pained to see war breaking out involving Ukraine and want to see minimum civilian losses and want to urge all parties to exercise restraint to bring the war to an end. In this sense, I think China has already played a very stabilizing role. China is not picking one side against the other. China is not adding more fuel to the fire. China does not want to see more and more people in Ukraine die. and. Some other countries are urging more and more civilians to fight until they die. This is the indecent way to treat the Ukrainian people. Ukrainian civilians need to be protected and their lives need to be saved. I think China has all the good spirit to bring to this very unfortunate conflict. And if China can exercise some good offices and do some uh, mediation, of course, I truly believe China will do it. And the fact that China has good channels of communication with both Russia on the one hand and Ukraine on the other hand means that China is one of the very few countries of great impact in the world of today who can really exert some positive uh, influence on the situation. Of course, everyone needs to do some work. Russia has made it very clear, no membership of NATO for Ukraine or over its dead body. Ukraine need to be realistic and uh, pragmatic and countries behind Ukraine, like the United States and NATO, should also heed the uh, uh, bottom heart grievances felt by Russia and no longer push the situation beyond the point of no return because what we may have is not this conventional war between Russia and Ukraine, it may be truly nuclear Armageddon. So I think good offices will be absolutely necessary if China can support, can play that role. I personally will give 100 percent support to that. Yeah, the foreign minister did say that, I'm quoting his words, China would like to work alongside with the international community to facilitate talks when needed, although he did not specifically direct say uh, in what ways. But China did stress the importance of keeping dialogues open all the way. Another question being raised by reporters at that press conference is whether this conflict or this crisis in Ukraine would impact China-EU relations. So, Ms. Zebla Rouge, let me get your take on this. Is some concern that this con conflict will affect this relationship between China and the bloc. The foreign minister said dialogue and cooperation between China and Europe are on the basis of mutual respect and mutual benefit, and that will provide more stability to the turbulent world situation. And he's also urging a European Union to form independent China policy. What do you make of this comment? 
well, I think the situation is very severe um, because, you know, the, uh, for example, the trade between the EU and China, which was a you know, pillar of world economy so far, is threatened by what is happening uh, between Ukraine and, and Russia. Uh, so I think that, you know, the sentiment in Europe right now is 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 really terrible. And I can only say that uh, what the foreign minister said is giving some hope that new ways can be found. And I, I really think that the model of Chinese uh, <clears throat> policy, the shared future of a uh, joint future of humanity, I think, you know, what is needed right now, in my view, and, and I think uh, Professor Kutznik is right in, in stressing the urgency of the question, um, you need something completely different. If we continue geopolitics as it has been done in the past, it, it is a question of time when humanity is crashing against the wall and it could lead to a nuclear extinction. So I think the model, you know, which would fit perfectly the shared community of the one humanity would be to convoke a uh, a conference, an international conference to take care of the security interest of every single country on the planet, because you cannot have a peace order without uh, taking care of the interest of every country. And there is a model in European history that is the Peace of Westphalia. The Peace of Westphalia ended 150 years of religious war, uh, culminating in the 30 years war, and it was based on the recognition of all war parties that if the war would continue, there would be nobody left to enjoy the result. And this is, in a certain sense, a parallel situation to the one we are facing today, because if it comes to nuclear war, there will be no winner. There will be nobody left to even comment on the result. So I think that should be a motivation to convoke a new piece of Westphalia conference with the specific aim to conduct uh, an international new security architecture, which would include Russia, include China. And I think this would be in perfect uh, spirit with the policy of President Xi Jinping about the shared community of, of mankind and the one future we all have. And of course, on the other hand, another question was also being asked about how this would play out uh, in terms of China-Russia relations, Professor Gao. Uh, the foreign minister responded by saying that China is sticking to this principle of non-alliance, non-confrontation, but he also said the friendship between the two peoples, Russian and Chinese, are rock solid. I mean, how would you interpret all this, given what's going on in the background? Absolutely. China-Russia relations are not alliance. This is very important. And the friendship between the two countries is not directed against any third country. This is also very important. Both China and Russia and their top leaders have emphasized that while the relations are not that of alliance, it's stronger and better than alliance. And the two countries do coordinate very closely on many international uh, issues and both countries do not want to see any single country or superpower to manhandle their relations against Russia on the one hand or against China. Both China and Russia are proud nations with full conviction about their capability to defend their sovereignty and territorial integrity. Now, this is very important. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi once said that so long as China and Russia remain friendly towards each other, no political force can break up their close friendship. Now, on the other hand, the relations between China and Russia is not an alliance. That means China has its own independence of foreign decision-making, and vis-a-vis -vis the situation involving Ukraine, China wants to see whichever issue involved in this very complicated situation to see what's the merit of this, and then decide its position accordingly. And we need to see through all the complexities. And this is the time which call for all our wisdom and uh, foresight and vision and courage to overcome the shortcomings of the immediate present, but also to see into the future. So I think China has all the good intentions and China can work with Russia on the one hand and also try to make the case to Ukraine on the other hand. And China is such a powerful and impactful country, one of the five permanent member states of the Security Council. So when it does mediation, 
it's very influential and impactful as far as the United States or NATO member states are concerned. So hopefully this is a historical moment for China to step up and to exercise some kind of global leadership with the only aim of saving more civilians and bring the war to an end as quickly as possible. It is a testing time for the international community. And of course, the ties between China and United States are discussed today. This is probably one of the most important relations in the world, diplomatically speaking. And Professor Kuznick, an NBC reporter uh, from America today asked the foreign minister, was he worried that the relationship between the two countries would get worse, would continue to get worse, because there seemed to be this bipartisan support for competition against China. I mean, th these competitions we see, they are bleeding into every sector, essentially, of U.S.-China interactions nowadays, trade, tech, you name it. Are we going to see this trend continue, or can we avoid a downward spiral? What do you think? It was back in 2018 that the U.S. had a new security policy saying that global terrorism was no longer the main threat to U.S. security. It was Russia and China. And during the Trump years, relations between U.S. and China deteriorated markedly. Trump called for a trade war against China. He treated China effectively as an enemy. Uh, we had hoped when Biden came to office that there was going to be a dramatic change. But from the beginning, Biden announced that he was going to maintain this air of competition with China rather than cooperation. Uh, that was uh, the wrong foot to get started on. Uh, and he has not really eased the tariffs that Trump put in place. In fact, if you look at Biden's advisors, he's got 16 top advisors from the Center for New American Security, including Kurt Campbell. Many of these people were the architects of the Asia pivot under Obama. So these have been people who've had a hardline approach toward China. You know, they talk about it in terms of China's human rights record, but they see it as a competitive relationship. China, on the other hand, talks more positively about win-win cooperation. It's a different approach, different thinking. And uh, unfortunately, the U.S. attitude toward China now is not very positive. You asked before about China's relations with Europe. Again, one of the reasons why we stress the importance of China taking the lead in, uh, in the negotiations around Ukraine right now is if China can provide that kind of leadership and find, help us find a way out of the crisis now, then China's uh, image in the world will be much more positive. One of the things that concerns China is that public opinion toward China has been declining, not only in the United States, where about 70 percent of the people have a negative attitude toward China, but in Europe also. China can actually reverse that by now acting on the world stage as the leader in a positive, peaceful way. I think that will do a lot for China's image. And the foreign minister today was very blunt about uh, the United States Indo-Pacific uh, region strategy, right, Professor Gao? He is calling uh, the Quad a Indo-Pacific version of NATO and is calling this a uh, disruption to the region, to uh, region stability. Absolutely. I think this was one of the most important remarks Foreign Minister Wang Yi said during his long uh, press conference. I think China now is categorically uh, positioned against Quad calling it the Asian Pacific version of NATO. And this happens at a time when China has already officially expressed opposition to the continued expansion of NATO itself. So I think China wants every country involved in this part of the world or in Europe, for example, to know that NATO should not be used as an offensive, aggressive organization. It should return back to its original mission of being a defensive uh, organization. And in Asia-Pacific region, we need peace and stability. We need to grow our economy. We need to improve the living standards of the people, rather than being divided into warring blocks against each other. But fundamentally, eventually, those who join the U.S. bloc will be used as a pawn in a futile attempt to, let's say, derail China's development. Mm -hmm. China also needs to make it very clear that no country should deprive the 1.4 billion Chinese people of their right 
to develop, because that opposition against China's right of development should be considered as the greatest crime against humanity. You know, this year actually marks the 50th anniversary since uh, former U.S. President Nixon uh, visited China. But now we're sort of experiencing a low point uh, in the bilateral relations. But actually, the two countries did cooperate before, did act in a complementary ways in so many sectors, fighting counterterrorism or fighting uh, climate change, right? Working with each other actually can bring real tangible benefits. How can we manage our differences now constructively? You mentioned uh, uh, former President Richard Nixon. When he visited China in 1985, I was his interpreter for about a week. We traveled to Beijing and several other cities. I got to know him very well. I think the hostility between China and the United States before Nixon's official visit to China in 1972 and before Dr. Henry Kissinger's secret visit to China in 1971 was worse than China-U.S. confrontation today. That gives me the hope that while China-U.S. relations now have been poisoned by some anti-China figures in the United States, mm -hmm. I'm confident about the medium and longer term relations between China and the United States. Why? Because Chinese people are not enemies of the American people. And China and the United States should not be enemies against each other. We need to figure out a way to get along. I think what President Nixon did in 1972 should and could be repeated by statesmen of great wisdom in China as well as in the United States. The American people will be better served if they realize eventually, philosophically and fundamentally, that China is not their enemy and the Chinese people could get along with the American people. I'm very convinced that this will be the outcome eventually. Another topic I want to touch upon is that China is hosting uh, this year's BRICS summit. The APEC and G20 would also be held in Asia this year. The foreign minister said Asia's time has come in global governance and it will transform from followers to front runners and even pace setters. Uh, Ms. LaRouge, let me get your take on this. I mean, these are very strong words coming from the foreign minister. Um, what do you make of his assessment here? Well, I think it's absolutely uh, to the point because the Asian countries uh, in general, not just China, but also some other Asian countries are very conscious of their 5,000 year old history. And from that standpoint of a positive tradition, they define a future and they want to develop. And this is the common idea of the BRICS, the SCO, uh, even you know other organizations. Uh, and that is in stark contract, uh, contrast to Europe and the United States. And I think that the idea of a, you know, a new model of international relations, if these organizations, these, you know, even even if it would be brought into the G20, the idea that you need a new model of international relations, which has been stressed by uh, by Wang Yi today again, um, you know, so that should be filled with content, because I think that we have either the choice of ending up in a geopolitical confrontation, which would you know be to the detriment of everybody and possible nuclear war or we make a jump in the evolution of civilization by defining the international relations, you know, in a certain sense, in the tradition of the non-aligned movement, the Bandung Conference, the five principles of peaceful coexistence of the UN Charter, but also giving it the vision of solving together the main problems of humanity, such as that we still have a pandemic, we need a modern health system in every single country to defeat this pandemic and the danger of new ones. Uh, we have a world famine of, as uh, Beasley from the World Food, Pro Food Program always says, of biblical dimensions. This will get bigger because of the inflation of food prices, of fertilizer, of energy prices. So there is an urgent agenda. And I think if this year could be used to say we need a new model of international relations which overcomes geopolitics. Uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi and also President Xi Jinping have made references by saying, why not have the Belt and Road Initiative cooperate with the Build Back Better Initiative of the United States and the Global Gateway of the European Union? So if these initiatives would be, rather than being in a competition, 
be streamlined and say, let's address together that what is pressing all of mankind, world hunger, epidemics, uh, you know, the, the, the poverty. I mean, with the present financial system of the transatlantic sector going completely out of whack, we are facing a new collapse, much worse than 2008. The Federal Reserve was not able to taper the interest rate because they are afraid if they increase the interest rate, we will have a, a mass collapse of bankruptcies. So there is an urgent need to have a new financial system, uh, you know, a new Bretton Woods system, a new credit system, which provides credit for development of all developing countries. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the points which, you know, really will be the test of humanity. Can mm -hmm. we, at, when we face fundamental challenges, give ourselves an order which allows the survival and happiness of all people on this planet. Yeah, these are and I think that will the be the agenda for... Yeah, we face collectively as community, right? And Professor Kuznick, you know, the foreign minister talked about China's relations with a number of entities, right? ASEAN nations, Japan, South Korea, BRICS nation, Latin American countries, South African countries. To you, what seem to be the priorities for China's diplomacy in this year ahead? China actually staked out a very interesting position back in March in Anchorage when uh, uh, Wang Yi and Yang Jiaxi uh, made clear that the old American dominated order, the old unipolar order, the old era of American hegemony was over. What we're entering now is a new era of multipolarity. And it's important that the world begin to understand that. My colleagues are talking about a new global security architecture. That's absolutely essential. But we have to remember we're at a crisis point right now. And we could either go in a positive direction or we could go in a terribly negative direction. My colleagues have also been, been warning about the threat of nuclear war. That's very, very real. In some sense, we're closer to nuclear war now than at any time certainly in the last 60 years since the Cuban Missile Crisis and the development that with Putin putting his nuclear forces on high alert, with the fighting at the biggest uh, nuclear reactor in Europe uh, and with the nuclear threats being issued right now, we could go the opposite direction and all of this positive vision that we're all sharing and talking about of human potential can be destroyed very, very quickly. So China, again, has got to play a more aggressive, positive role than it has played in the past. It is now the, becoming the world's dominant economy. It's a major force militarily. It's got to take geopolitical leadership of a sort because the vision that the U.S. is pushing now is still a divide and conquer kind of vision. And China's win-win vision is much more positive. And hopefully China can play a constructive role and bring some positive view to global governors, right? Thank you very much. That's all the time we have for this edition of Dialogue. We appreciate your insights and analysis. Professor Galjikai joining me here in the studio. Ms. Zeplarouche joining me there. And Professor Kuznick joining me live via Skype. And that's all the time we have. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.